This is Think Energy, the podcast that helps you better understand the fast-changing world of energy through conversations with game changers, industry leaders, and influencers. So join me, Dan Sege, as I explore both traditional and unconventional facets of the energy industry. Hey everyone, welcome back. While local and global efforts focus on achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 through the electrification or transformation of certain industries, it is also important to consider the significant role natural climate solutions can play in greening communities. Warren Buffett famously said, someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. Trees make our world a beautiful place and provide us with many lasting benefits such as shade, privacy, shelter, and food, and they contribute to our mental well-being. Aside from those benefits, trees play an important role in carbon reduction, slowing the rise of GHG emissions as they grow. But If you know anything about electricity, you know that electricity and trees seldom mix. That doesn't mean they can't be good neighbors, though. Across the city of Ottawa, there is an estimated 185,000 trees in proximity to Hydro Ottawa's 2,800 kilometers of overhead high voltage power lines. When trees are close enough to potentially contact overhead power lines, public safety and the uninterrupted supply of electricity can be compromised. Utilities have a responsibility to ensure its electricity distribution system is safe and that it operates reliably. Because of that, they must also ensure that their equipment can withstand extreme weather events such as high winds, and heavy snowfalls and ice. Broken tree branches can bring down power lines and create serious public safety concerns like damaged equipment, fires, and power outages. All of which can be frustrating and a costly experience for both the utility company and customers. In an urban area, the presence of trees adds an additional layer of complexity to the challenge of maintaining reliable and resilient power grids. Finding a way to minimize power outages while preserving a healthy urban tree canopy is an important goal for urban planners and utility companies. Through a combination of strategic tree planting, pruning and maintenance, as well as the use of technology and innovative solutions, it's possible to strike a balance between these two important priorities, ensuring that the city remains livable and sustainable for years to come. Responsible tree trimming and maintenance has resulted in reducing power outages by 40% in Ottawa alone. With extreme weather events we've witnessed in the past few years, and as climate continues to change, the outcome will create more problems for utilities to provide reliable power to customers without extended outages. So here is today's big question. In the age of climate change and environmental responsibility, how can utility companies strike a balance between maintaining reliable service, minimizing outages, and maintaining a healthy and vibrant urban forest. To help us better understand this balancing act, I've invited Nick Levac, who's the supervisor of distribution operations, and a forestry inspector, Greg Tipman. Welcome both. Greg, I'll start with you. Can you tell us a bit about your work and what the biggest misconceptions are about tree trimming and vegetation control programs when it comes to electricity? For sure, Dan, and uh, j- just just again, thanks for uh, for having us on uh, your podcast this morning. Uh, again, kind of meat and potatoes. You know, my, my daily job encompasses uh, speaking with customers, have, uh, addressing their vegetation concerns around power lines, 
uh, auditing of the contractor uh, we use, which is Aspen Tree Service. Um, there's also coordinating of our jobs, our, our time and material jobs. Uh, so it's uh, stuff that I look at uh, and deal with the customer and then gets delegated directly to a, uh, a secondary crew to, to do that specific work for the customer. There's also writing of prescriptions for any uh, uh, work for other jobs for, uh, for the customers. So uh, specific work they want Hydro Ottawa to do that's outside of our regular uh, trim program. Um, some of the biggest misconceptions that I've run into uh, is that um, a lot of the public thinks that our, our tree work is just a hack and slash, that there's no uh, thought or science put into the tree trimming that's actually going on. Uh, when act, in actuality, we have a whole set of standards uh, for proper pruning and, and tree trimming uh, of the species around the hydro wires. And that kicks back to our, our working procedures or our live line clearing uh, techniques. Uh, and then there's another, another misconception that I've run into quite a bit is that a lot of uh, people think that for us or for our contractor to do the tree trimming, uh, the power has to be shut off every single time. And that's, uh, that's not the case. It's, uh, we like to keep it as a very rare um, scenario when we do have to shut the power off. And that's usually just for a uh, uh, safety, safety issue for the, for the tree trimmers. Okay, cool, Nick. Um, we often say that trees and electrical wires don't mix. What types of dangerous situations can occur if they come in contact with one another? Is there a recent example you can share with us? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, first first of mine is obviously power outages. Um, that's kind of the, the first thing that we hear about uh, when a tree comes down on, on our conductors. Um, but, uh, you know, the power outages can vary from, you know, a whole circuit right back to a substation to just a localized outage in your community or along your street. Um, the other thing, uh, if the tree does come down on the line and our, and our system doesn't, uh, doesn't experience an outage, oftentimes trees uh, can catch on fire. So we've had, uh, we've had examples over the years where trees just rested on a line. Uh, nobody notices it and then eventually it'll catch on fire, uh, which, which obviously can cause other issues and especially in the summertime with dry conditions, if that, uh, if that does come down on the ground, it could, you know, start forest fires, which unfortunately our neighbors in the, in the, in the South and the U S have, have experienced, uh, down in California and stuff. So, um, but, um, uh, there was, there was one, uh, larger outage and I think it was the start of November, November 2nd, where a, a spruce tree, uh, that was quite a bit away from the line, uh, did fail and it came down and, and took down two, uh, two, uh, conductors out at the end of, uh, Hotmar Road, I believe it was, and it caused a large outage. Um, we were in a sense, those are almost better to have because it's easier to find that tree and where the problem is. And, uh, and we can get crews out to fix it, uh, in a, in a quick manner, but, uh, that's probably the most uh, recent one that we've had that had a major outage and a big impact to our system. So we're clear, Nick, what are the guidelines that determine if tree trimming or vegetation management near power lines is required? What does sufficient clearance from an electrical equipment look like? Yeah, so, so like Greg mentioned in, in the first question there, we, we, have, uh, we have arborists going through our system and, and we're looking at, uh, at standards that we trim to. Uh, the city's divided up into about 30 vegetation management zones and uh, they're divided into either a two or three year trim cycle, which means you'll see arborists in your backyard or on the streets uh, trimming out um, to our guidelines uh, either every second year or third year. Um, our main goal, uh, there's a couple of them, but our main goal when we're trimming uh, to our standards that we have is when we come back in either two or three years, the vegetation that we trimmed out is still three feet away. Uh, there's different uh, zones that we uh, have from 10 feet back to the, the conductor or the live overhead wire. And uh, from the wire out to three feet is called the restricted zone. Um, and as I mentioned, that, that's where we do not want the vegetation to get into. Uh, because if, we, if it does get in there, it creates a bunch of different problems uh, for, our, for our, our tree arborist uh, to go in there. And, and as Greg mentioned, our outages is the last thing we want to do when we're trimming trees. And if that veg does get into that restricted zone, uh, increased outages for trimming is something, an option that we have to look at, which we're trying to avoid. So um, 
that's uh, that's kind of our main goal. Uh, we look at the species of tree um, and how much it would grow in a year. And as the arborist comes through, they're going to trim back that many feet. So if we have a fast growing species uh, that grows, say, three or four feet a year, and we're going to be back in two years, we're going to trim that back uh, three feet times two plus the additional three feet. So we're looking about a 10 foot trim uh, on that. Nick, pruning and especially removal of interfering trees often cause controversy. In an age of climate change and environmental responsibility, what do you tell folks that object to or have concerns about the important work you do to help keep the lights on and trees safe? Yeah, that's that's a great question. We, uh, you know, our, our, I think you hit the last word there and your question kind of hits on our main goal of, of everything that we do here at Hydro is safety. So. Uh, not only are we looking out for the public safety, uh, ensuring that trees are coming down on the line and, and staying energized, but we're also looking out for our worker safety. Um, so as we're going through, uh, we, we try to do um, preventative maintenance, so to speak. Uh, so very much like you get your oil changed in a car or you put uh, your winter tires on uh, this time of year, uh, we're, we're trying to trim trees away from the lines to make sure they don't come in contact, uh, that avoids outages. Uh, unplanned outages, especially because, um, it, it, you know, it's one thing to get a phone call to say, hey, your power is going to be out because we're doing preventative maintenance, whether it's tree trimming or upgrading the electrical system. It's another thing to wake up at two o'clock in the morning and have your lights out and the heat off and everything, and it's unexpected and, and you're trying to get ready or, you know, kids are at home or whatever. So uh, preventative maintenance is the big thing. And, and we try to educate our customers that uh, what we're doing out there is really just to make sure that um, we can decrease outages and especially those unplanned outages. Um, the other thing that we look at when we're pruning trees is the tree health. And I know Greg's going to get into this, I think a little bit later on, but uh, just looking at the species of tree and how we trim them to make sure that the health of the tree uh, is, is also a huge uh, interest for our arborists that are up there. They're all certified uh, trained arborists uh, with uh, some, um, extra training on the electrical side because obviously we're trimming around live electrical lines but when they get up into a tree they're looking at the health of the tree uh, there's a lot of stuff once they get up into the canopy of the tree that they notice that you can't see from the ground so they're, they're taking into account and they're taking out any dead wood or anything in there and, and try to not only uh, like I mentioned before getting those clearances that we need for the electrical side but also trying to enhance the tree growth uh, away from our lines and looking at the, the health of the tree by taking any dead wood or anything out of it. So back to you, Greg. I know you trim trees on public property that are within three meters of an overhead line, but what about on private property? Trees near utility lines inherently carry serious risk to property owners who may be injured or even killed when working near power lines. What are homeowners responsible for and when should they call the utility to arrange for their help? Like a planned outage, basically, what do homeowners need to know? Yeah, Dan, so when you're speaking about uh, kind of responsibilities uh, on vegetation maintenance, <clears throat> Hydro Ottawa is responsible for the pole to pole wire uh, vegetation maintenance. Uh, the area around the high voltage wire that uh, hydro trims is part of our responsibility is 10 feet uh, for the primary, which is usually the, uh, the very top wire running pole to pole, as well as uh, about a three foot clearance around our low voltage or secondary wires. And again, that, that's, that's the pole to pole wires. Uh, just, I want to make that kind of bold statement, that's, that's Hydro's responsibility. That's part of our maintenance package, uh, kind of like uh, Nick, Nick was touching up on. And uh, that's, that, that happens pending what grid, what year, you know, two to three years central uh, within kind of the city core versus the, uh, the outer rural areas. Uh, if a customer's looking to have work done on their tree, which is growing out of their private property, and it's near our overhead wires, uh, Hydro comes in, uh, free charge, we get it clear 10 feet, 10 feet back, debris would stay on site, and then it would be the homeowner's responsibility to either cut the tree down themselves, hire a private tree contractor, or if they wanted, they could also hire Hydro Ottawa, do our uh, Work for Others program, and we would write them out a formal tree quote, and they would, they would pay an additional cost for that 
that work that's outside of our regular maintenance scope. Um, now, in regards to the, the wires running pole to house, a service wire, or if you're in a rural area and it's a, a private primary wire, there's a couple options that they have for having those, what, those wires, that vegetation trimmed out. Uh, they can either hire a private tree contractor and Hydro Ottawa, our service department, provides one free disconnect a year for any tree work. Um, a little bit more legwork for, for the customer or the contractor to do, uh, but it's an entirely viable option. Uh, the second option is they can, again, hire Hydro to trim out their service wire um, to whatever specs we normally recommend. It, it, you know, it, it's a low voltage secondary wire uh, to have about a three foot clearance on it. Um, if they want us to go with that option. I myself would write them out a formal tree quote, have all the details, uh, proof of payment beforehand would be had, and then we would schedule in uh, the customer an exact date, and they would, uh, they would essentially have, have the work done to, to what the quote was that they're paying for the work to be done and, uh, and, and, and go from there. It's, uh, it's quite effective. We've got a lot of um, feedback from, from the customers about uh, having their service wire trimmed out, and um, yeah, there's been a lot, a, lot of, a lot of good things uh, to have come from having us on site and just doing it all and not having to worry with them having to organize a, uh, an outage on their house. So it's, uh, it's been a good go. Here's another question for you, Greg. When planting a young sapling, it's often difficult to imagine that in a few years, like 10 years, it could have significant impact on the landscape with an expanding canopy. As a homeowner, or a landscaper, if you are planting a new tree, how important is it to contact your utility service provider to discuss your plans? Do you have any tree planting advice or some good resources on what to plant and where? Yes, yes. So basically, uh, Hydro Ottawa has a really good uh, source on our, our internet uh, page. Uh, basically, just Type in Google out Hydro Ottawa uh, tree planting advice, and it'll take uh, take you right to our, our it's a pamphlet that's been put onto uh, to the internet, and it has everything for suggestions of um, where the tree should be planted, what type of species is it, how tall will it grow, how wide will the canopy grow, uh, how many feet back from an overhead wire should be planted. Um, it has a breakdown of uh, you know species names, what soils they're, they're best to be planted in. Um, you know, like I said, their their typical growth structure um, in relation to overhead wires. And there's also uh, advice given on uh, planting around underground wires, which a, a lot of people you know you don't see them, you you don't really think they're there, uh, but they are. You know, most people just see the you know the green box, uh, the the, the the ground transformer, if you will, um, but where are the wires going? What, uh, which, which way can I can I plant and whatnot? So, um, it's a really great resource. has a lot of uh, information, a lot of diagrams. Um, definitely check it out. Um, uh, another and then another great option would be just put a call in, have myself or Nick uh, show up, and you know we can tell you you know basically um, you know where. You know, what, what's the lay of the land? What is your yard showing you? You know, are there other trees in the neighborhood or in your yard? You can get a very good look just from seeing what's out there, what to expect, and then, uh, and then go from there. Okay, Nick, this next question might be in your wheelhouse. A power outage occurs when there's direct contact between two conducting lines face to face, or by providing a path for electricity to travel to the ground. There are several other ways that vegetation, trees in particular, can cause power outages. Wondering if you could expand on the causes and how utilities and folks in your profession mitigate that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's um, it's an interesting question, and it's, it's obviously something we we look at uh, all the time. And that's our our biggest goal within our department is is to mitigate those outages and. I actually came from a background in the lines department uh, as, as a power line maintainer for, for 10 years and then, and then swung over and, and 
got into working with the veg management uh, program and um uh, you know I, it's a it's a really good partnership that we have right now uh, not only with uh, with greg and our, our other utility forestry inspectors uh, but along with our contractor uh, aspen who's doing the work for us and you know that's a, a constant conversation that we're having week in week out and, and not only are we reviewing any outages that might have occurred um, the week before and trying to follow up on those to see why those power outages occurred and how we can hopefully prevent them from from reoccurring uh, but um, within within the system itself, the electrical uh, system, uh, we have um, it, it's very much like your your house. It's it's set up where we have different um, different circuits all the way through the city, and within each circuit, we have different fusing. Uh, the further you get away from the substation, so um, the fusing coordination can really help out if if you have a tree that falls at the very end of that circuit. Uh, we have the fusion set up in a way that it's only going to go back to the next device uh, downstream. Uh, and if everything is working properly, that fuse will open up and it'll really uh, shrink the size of that outage rather than going all the way back to the substation. So if you can imagine if you have a, a thousand customers on, on a circuit and you have 10 different fuses all the way down and that last one blows, you're going to only affect 100 people instead of 1,000 people. Um, also within our system, we have devices called reclosures. Um, so I'm sure many, many, uh, many listeners have uh, had their lights flicker on and off uh, two or three times. Uh, and then unfortunately, uh, after that third flicker, uh, the power does stay off permanently. Uh, that means that there, there's a bigger issue on the line and that reclosure could self-clear. So those devices are there to, for uh, momentary outages when they see a spike in amperage. Uh, they'll open up the circuit and give time for that tree or, or whatever that foreign interference is to clear itself and then close back in with the hopes that uh, once it closes back in that, that that power will stay on uh, if it senses that it's still there it'll it'll open back up again uh, hopefully allow it to clear a little bit longer close back in again and, and hopefully the second time's a charm uh, unfortunately sometimes that doesn't work and uh, and then you experience that outage um, kind of the last kind of protection uh, in, in the whole stream of protection devices is, is that circuit breaker back at the station. That's kind of the worst case. If we see a circuit open up, uh, that means that there's a major problem. Uh, usually, like you mentioned there, there's a phase-to-phase -phase kind of issue where two conductors have slapped together. Um, and, that, and that's kind of what causes the biggest outage. That's when we know we have a, a large problem. Um, and the, uh, the other issue with that is because our circuits are so long, some of them are, you know, in the downtown core where we have more substations, um, it, it's a little bit easier um, to, to find because, you know, the circuit might only be, say, a kilometer or two long. But if you get out into the rural uh, Orleans, Canada, down south, the old Manitick and Pean area, uh, you can have, you know, 10, 15, uh, 20 kilometers a line. So if, if your circuit uh, breaker in your station opens up, that means that somewhere between your station and the end of the line is your problem. So there, there are uh, fault indicators and stuff on your line that can help pinpoint it, but um, it definitely can make it more challenging when you're, when you're starting back at your substation now having to patrol 20, 20 kilometers a line versus if that fuse opens at the very end of your line, you know, okay, it's the last section within that line. Um, the other thing that can really help us out is, um, uh, is, uh, is the customers in, in the field. So a lot of times we'll get calls in and, and um, it's, it's great to get that information and, and Hydro Ottawa is very active on social media and that, that definitely helps if, if a customer sees a problem, if they see a line down, if they see a bright blue flash, if they hear a loud bang, uh, you know, first and foremost, um, let us know. Don't, don't ever approach down wire, stay away, even trees that could be leaning up against the wire. And I, and I mentioned this before, just because the trees against the wire, if, if that wire is still energized, that could potentially energize that tree. So we want to make sure we stay back, you know, ten, stay back 10 meters from that tree, stay back 10 meters from that electrical line, because you don't know if it's on or if it's still alive. So your safety is first and foremost. Uh, call in, call 911 if there's any, you know, immediate hazard, fire police can come and, and assist. They will get a hold of our system office right away and direct us to that. Or if it's something that's, uh, you know, a little bit less and you think that Hydro should know, we have lots of different social media channels you can reach out to, uh, on um, and, and let us know. And that really does help because that information does find its way down to the crews in the field and it helps us get to the outage and find that problem that's causing the outage that much quicker. In addition 
to being a qualified arborist, Greg, you also have extensive knowledge about electricity. Can you talk about this dual role and special qualifications that you have? How dangerous is your job? And do you work around live electricity at high voltage? Yeah, Dan. So just a little little background on my, uh, I guess my schooling and, and qualifications. So I did my uh, uh, forestry technologist diploma at Algonquin. It was a, a two-year program. And then uh, from there, I, I w moved out to BC to work on uh, some really big trees. And uh, while out there, I morphed into the uh, utility side of the tree work. Uh, and that's where I, I went and did my apprenticeship program. Uh, from there, you need approximately 4,000 hours just to qualify. Uh, the program's a two-year program. Uh, you accumulate about about 6,000 hours uh, around of live line clearing, uh, working around uh, the wires. Um, you learn how electricity, all the basics of electricity, how it works, how to identify the equipment. Um, that coupled with your actual tree work in the tree, the, the, the tools, special tools you'll be using, so dielectrically tools, um, how to operate bucket trucks, uh, so on and so forth, uh, rigging. Uh, big chunks of wood down in trees, how to do it safely, uh, all in the while uh, in close proximity to these, these overhead uh, high voltage wires. Um, it's very, very dangerous. I mean, you, you couple your, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 feet up, hanging by ropes. Um, you're using a chainsaw um, to cut wood. Plus you have a live line that's, you know, five, six feet away from you. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely very dangerous, but the, uh, the schooling, um, the on the job training that you get just, you know, old hands showing you the, the, the techniques, the, the up-to-date safety standards and whatnot. Um, it, it makes your comfort level something that you would never, you know, come natural to you, uh, become second nature. So it's, uh, it's definitely a process. It's, it's definitely building uh, the confidence over time. Um, and then, you know, taking classes, um, learning, I, whether it's uh, through the International Society of Arboriculture on the tree side of things for tree health, you know, um, what are the tree species, tree bi biology, pests, you know, a lot of times custom customers will ask, you know, why is my tree dying? Why, why is it uh, declining? Um, a lot of times people will think, you know, it's it's hydro. You, you trimmed the tree incorrectly. Well, no, it's you know a, a, tr a pest infestation, or you did some landscaping or whatnot. The roots have been killed and whatnot. So um, it, it's learning all that that you know information uh, and coupling it and pairing it with the uh, the electrical side of things that uh, it really makes for a, a harmonious um, job and and. Uh, you know, a, a great aspect to keep learning. There's always new information, new research coming out on uh, on trees and, and the electrical side of things. Um, you know, um, and then just just basically, you know, having having the resources also at Hydro Ottawa, um, it, it it makes that partnership uh, that much better for for getting the work done and and done safely. Okay, so Greg. I've seen some amazing footage of folks in your profession climbing pretty high in trees. So besides not having a fear of heights, what's that like? And what's the favorite thing about your job? Have you ever surprised some birds or even squirrels or they have surprised you? Yeah. So kind of like I was touching on there. I mean, the fear of heights is not, it was never really the, the big big deal. It was more trusting your gear, uh, knowing that, you know, a, a 10, 12 millimeter diameter rope is going to hold you and your gear. Um, you know, it's going to hold, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, wood swinging around and whatnot. It's not going to break off, you know, that your knots have been tied correctly. They're not going to come undone. You're going to fall to your death and get injured or whatnot. Those were kind of the, the first fears to really to get over. Um, but once you get that, it's, it's practice. The more you do it, the more you get comfortable doing it, uh, the more you feel safe and secure. Um, I've definitely had some weird, interesting animal encounters while working in, in the trees. I've had birds 
land on my head and, and stay there while working. Um, I've had raccoons, you know, climb out of hollows. Uh, I've had bats, you know, fly out from underneath bark. Uh, but probably the scariest was, I wasn't in the tree yet, but we were doing some ground slash in BC and probably 10, 12 feet away, a black bear just goes running right by. And yeah, it was, uh, it was exhilarating, but it, it was done in a flash and yeah, nothing, nothing more, but you know, it definitely, you know, could have been a, a different, interesting situation had it been a, uh, you know, an angry bear, if you will, or whatnot. <laughs> but you know, for uh, for the mo yeah, for the most part, it's uh, the job. You, you get to see nature all the time, and there's always uh, you know something something great to see, animal wise. Okay, both. Are you ready to tag team and close us off with some rapid fire questions? Greg, I'm going to start with you. What's your favorite tree? Can I give you four, Dan? <laughs> so eastern white pine. Uh, the monkey puzzle tree, giant sequoia, and the Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Nick, let's move on to you. What is one thing you can't live without? Ah, uh, it's got that's an easy one. It's got to be my family, uh, my two girls at home, my my lovely wife, and uh, and probably a, a good cup of coffee or a nice americano in the morning just to get things going. Greg, what habit or hobby? have you picked up during shelter in place uh probably flying and crashing my drone <laughs> yeah <laughs> a little more practice <laughs> okay next one is for you nick if you could have one superpower what would it be uh yeah. you know what i, I think never to age physically uh, only in wisdom um the body's getting a little bit older and every you know every time i go out and, and, and try to play hockey or do something now I wake up a little bit sore in the morning so if i could keep my physical health uh, maybe back when i was in my 20s that would be that would be amazing what about you greg what would your superpower be maybe just unlimited superpowers <laughs> okay back to you nick if you could turn back time and talk to your 18 year old self, what would you tell him? You know, if, if uh, I, I'd probably try to let him in on a couple of neat, uh, you know, world events that, that were going to take place between uh, then and, and then when they're my age now and, and just make, tell him to go there and make sure he's present. And no matter what the cost is, uh, sometimes you only get once a, once a, in a lifetime chance to see things and make sure he's not, uh, he gets there to, to experience that life live. And lastly, this one is for the both. What do you currently find most interesting in your sector, Greg? It's uh, it's really the day to day change. There's always uh, a different challenge that's coming up. Uh, you're always in a different location, dealing with different people. So it's never you know a mon a monotonous job. It's uh, it, it's always fluid. There's always something new. What about you, Nick? Uh, what excites me the most coming down the pipe, I think, is the technology that uh, hopefully we're, we're, we're going to be exposed to. I mean, uh, Greg mentioned uh, crashing his drone, but, uh, you know, just even stuff like that and us being able to fly our overhead lines and, and really take a good uh, snapshot of what that vegetation looks like within our city and, uh, and what we can do to kind of have a good mix between uh, – you know, maintaining that urban canopy in Ottawa and then also at the same time keeping the electricity on. And if we can use uh, different types of technology that's coming down the pipe to, to find a balance between the two that we can get out and, and proactively trim trees because we know exactly where they are uh, and, and also keep that urban canopy for, the, for our customers here in Ottawa, I, I think there's, a, there's an interesting mix coming down uh, how we can leverage that technology uh, to our advantage. Nick and Greg. We've reached the end of another episode of the Think Energy Podcast. I hope you had a lot of fun. And again, thank you so much for joining me today. Cheers. Thanks again for having us, Dan. Yes, thank you, Dan. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of the Think Energy Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you're listening. And to find out more about today's guest or previous episodes, visit thinkenergypodcast.com. I hope you'll join us again next time. 
as we spark even more conversations about the energy of tomorrow.